Hebrews chapter 12, I'm going to begin reading verse 25 where it says, See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking, for if those did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. And his voice shook the earth then, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken as of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, until we receive a kingdom, or excuse me, therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable sacrifice with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. That's just waiting for all the cheering to die down. We can we move on. That's, uh, we, we spent some time looking at this last week. I don't anticipate dealing with it in that exact same way again, but I want to review some briefly. At the beginning of verse 25, it says, See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. Within the context, what he's just immediately said before that is that Jesus' blood speaks better than Abel's. And that the blood of Jesus is teaching us something. But within the overall context of Hebrews, we know from chapter 1 that, that he said to us, right back here where'd you go chapter one uh at verse one god after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways in these last days has spoken to us in his son whom he appointed heir of all things through whom also he made the world so we're contrasting the old with the new we're saying now you're getting the voice of the son now it's jesus and his blood, which is crying out to us, even from heaven. Now it's this new covenant, and the blood of this new covenant, and the testimony of this new covenant, and the mediator of this new covenant who's calling out to us. And he says, you better make sure you pay attention. See to it that you do not refuse him. Don't overlook this. This is one of the, the key themes running right through Hebrews is, when God's speaking to you, pay attention. It says a, a, a series of times, quoting from the Psalms in chapters 3 and 4, today... While it is called today, if you hear his voice, don't be stupid, don't harden your heart, don't turn away, don't, don't refuse, don't get stiff neck, don't be like folks were. If you hear his voice, today, if you hear his voice. And you, you, we, we, the, this, this realization that God's desire to reach out to us is not something to be treated lightly, like it's always going to be there. Well, he can call me tomorrow if he wants to talk. Call me on Tuesday if he wants to talk. We don't have to talk today. If he's talking, you better be listening. Let's say that again. If he's talking, you better be listening. And that, that's what verse 25 starts out saying in essence, right? See that you do not, do not refuse him who is speaking. Don't overlook this Jesus. Then again, he, he goes to this, this quote from Haggai and he says, when he says he's going to do it again, the implication is that this time is going to be special in some way. It's sort of a final time. And he says that when this shaking takes place, it's so that the things which can be shaken get shaken off, so that only that which is eternal remains. The created stuff, the temporal stuff, the stuff which doesn't have lasting power to it can get shaken off, and what remains is what's supposed to be there. Right? Right? Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude, by which we may offer to God an acceptable sacrifice with reverence and awe. This is the verse right here, verse 28, I want to spend some time with it this morning. Since we've received such a kingdom, since the kingdom we've received is unshakable, and within this context, what that's describing isn't just a kingdom with good foundations. It's describing a kingdom which is eternal and will last when everything which won't last is gone. Shakeable, within the context of this end part of Hebrews chapter 12, means temporal. Not always going to be here. Unshakable means eternal always going to be here, going to withstand whatever comes, right? And, and we've received a kingdom which is unshakable. That's good news. That's exciting. That's a powerful statement. And when we're talking about kingdoms, it's important for us to recognize the English word kingdom comes from our word king. This is very deep. It's the king's domain. It's where the king is in charge. 
The Greek word that we translate as kingdom also has the word for king as the the Greek word for king is the beginning part of the word and then it's a king's place. It is that belongs to a You say that that's doesn't really move me so far. Well, the point is this. The defining characteristic of him is the king. The king and his authority. We're used to maps where the political boundaries are drawn and it's blue on this side and it's yellow on that side and it's pink over there and there is no space in between that isn't anything. But in ancient times, there were kingdoms marked on maps and then there was kind of wilderness or no man's land in between, which was where nobody's authority was in control and you were kind of on your own if you were out there. If the bad guys jump you on that part of the map, you shouldn't have been there. The bad guys jump you on this part of the map, this king is coming out there to take care of those bad guys because they're messing with his people. Are, Are you home? A kingdom is where a king's authority is. Now, that part is, obviously has a lot of spiritual significance and, and plays into a very big study. The king's authority is where his kingdom is. His kingdom is where his authority is. But beyond that, it points to something which Dr. Cole says frequently, which is that the characteristics of the kingdom flow from the character of the king. And that's true everywhere. It's true in the business you work in. It's true in the home you live in. The character of the king is going to determine the characteristics of that kingdom. It got quiet again. And when the king's character isn't any good, the kingdom's characteristics aren't any good. Nobody wants to be there. It's not the place that's attractive. It got quiet again. But in this kingdom... The king we're talking about is Jesus Christ. And the character of Jesus Christ is above reproach. It's unimpeachable. There are people who slander Jesus, but nobody slanders him with cause. And as a consequence, the characteristics of his kingdom are also wonderful. Is that coming through? The character of the king determines the characteristics of the kingdom. Now, uh, let's spend a little bit of time, if you will, visiting with the character of the king. And I'm, I'm feeling a little celebratory this morning in the spirit. The point here isn't that we've got a lot of information that none of us have had that we need to download. The point here is let's talk about some things that probably most of us know, but we ought to be excited about. We've got an unshakable kingdom with an unshakable king who's worth having as your king. Nobody sits in this kingdom saying, I wish I were in that kingdom. That's where the real action is. This kingdom is where the life is. This kingdom is where the freedom is. This kingdom is where everything necessary for life and godliness is to be found. This is where the integrity is. This is where the good things are. This is where we live in reverence and awe and enjoy the peace and the joy of our king. This is a kingdom worth having. There are a great many kingdoms in this world which have problems with them which stem from the characteristics of the king. This kingdom has no problems because there's nothing wrong with the king. He's not pretty good on foreign policy, but he kind of messes up the economy a little bit. He's not really good on domestic issues, but he, he doesn't really seem to have a clear picture of what's going on in the world. Are you home? He doesn't have a favorite area. He doesn't have a specialty. He doesn't have something that he pays attention to and then he gets people, other people to handle other stuff for him. He is the unsurpassed, perfect king and it makes this kingdom the place to be. It's the right kingdom to take up residence in. It's the right kingdom to find yourself a citizen of. This is the kingdom which is supposed to move us. Now, I was uh, beginning to say, I think, let's go to Luke chapter 4 together for a moment, if you will. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus has come into the synagogue. 
And he says, stood up on the Sabbath day to take the privilege of reading. And it says in verse 17, the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book and found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. Now, this particular passage that he read does not describe the character of the king. It describes the activity of the king. But in the process of describing this activity, he makes the statement, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. He's describing the activity as being motivated from the Holy Spirit, that the Spirit of the living God, the true and the living God, is motivating this activity. And this is what we might expect to find the Holy Spirit doing at any given point. Because he doesn't get up every day and try to decide what kind of Holy Spirit he's going to be today. It got quiet out there. He's not like folks who have to decide whether this is going to be a good day or a bad day, whether I'm going to be nice or whether I'm going to be naughty, whether I, I'm planning to be mean. And you're all looking at me with that pious tone of voice on your face there. I've been in that office where somebody came in and it seems like they just made up their mind on the way. I'm going to be mad, I'm going to be ugly, and nobody's going to want to be near me today. And it's almost comical. It's like, are we in a sitcom? This is ridiculous. You're completely over the top. Just go somewhere and close the door behind you. You shouldn't be near people. You're not even a grown-up. What is the matter with you? Has anybody besides me worked with this person? Yeah. Well, folks sometimes have to decide what kind of day this is going to be. But the Holy Ghost never has to say, I wonder if today's a day I'm going to smack a bunch of them. What do you think, Father? Should we, not, should we not be doing anything good for people today? Should we maybe just go out there and find the particularly difficult ones and give them a whack? This is never, the Holy Spirit is like the Father, like the Son, the same yesterday, today, and forever, unchangeable. He's not a man that he just makes up his mind as he goes. He's the Lord who has made up his mind, and that's the way it is. Are you home? So if in Isaiah's time this was his desire, and if in the gospel times this was his desire, I'm going to suggest that right now this is his desire. That his anointing is to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. That's what the Holy Spirit is like. But the Holy Spirit also gets involved in character issues. Boy, it got quiet all of a sudden. So let's come with me, if you will, to Isaiah chapter 11 which is not where that passage comes from, but is, is the same prophet Isaiah, who had a great deal to say about the Spirit of God. And in Isaiah chapter 11, the Holy Spirit is going to describe the character of the king, or I should say the character of the king is going to be described in relationship to the Holy Spirit. It says in verse 1 of chapter 11, Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. Now, this is a, an amazing picture in verse 1. It's an amazing prophetic picture because the house of David has been cut off, not in the sense that there is no more house of David, but the, the descendants of David are not on the throne of Israel anymore. And the time has seems to have passed when we could talk about the house of David. But Jesse, who's David's father is being used in this particular prophetic passage. And he says, listen, from the stump of Jesse, apparently the tree having been cut down, a shoot is coming up. It's rising from the roots. There is a ruler coming, a future ruler, the Messiah, the real king, who is not going to just be the last branch on this tree, but is going to be a new start of this tree, a fresh start of this tree. 
He, he's going to be of his father David, but he's not going to be the next in a succession of those from their father David. He's going to be unique and stand apart from the other kings that you've had. He's not going to be like them. Are you getting the picture? The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. That's going to be significantly different. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding... The spirit of counsel and strength. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. This is describing the character of the king. This is the king whose character is defining the characteristics of the kingdom that we have been called into. It would be a good place to say amen or something. Hey, you, don't, you don't have to get engaged if you don't want to, but I'm just pointing out that the, there are opportunities there if you're looking for them. The Spirit of the Lord is going to be on him, and this is what he's going to be like. He's going to have the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of understanding. He's going to have the spirit of counsel and the spirit of strength. He's going to have the spirit of knowledge and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. This is going to be characteristic of him, and it's going to be characteristic of his kingdom. This kingdom that we're looking for has characteristics which are to be desired. I think I said that probably already, didn't I? Robert Ross, in describing this kingdom, this is good. He said, this kingdom will be given by God, not conceived by men. It's important to note the kingdom that we're talking about at the end of Hebrews chapter 12 isn't just the best iteration of our efforts. It isn't the next step forward in human government. It isn't finally we're going to all get together on this thing. We're going to build the Tower of Babel at the UN and we're all going to get along now. We're just going to hold hands and sing Kumbaya together. People are going to continue trying to make progress and trying to make efforts. We're going to reach toward utopian ideals, but we're going to keep falling short until God does this thing because there aren't anybody, there's no people anywhere who are going to get together, put together the brain trust, which is finally going to usher in the kingdom we're looking for. This kingdom will be given by God, not conceived by men. But then he points to the second half of the verse in, back in Hebrews 12, when he says, membership in it through faith in Christ ought to result in glad service and reverent worship on the part of all. We'll revisit that in a little bit. Is that making some sense to you? Charles Ryrie describing what these verses in Isaiah 11 are telling us about Jesus says that he's characterized by the fullness of the Holy Spirit and absolute integrity. I didn't get to the absolute integrity part yet. We're talking about the fullness of the Spirit so far. But these verses tell us that the king in our kingdom is characterized by the fullness of the Spirit, the fullness of the Holy Spirit, and absolute integrity. Uh, let's deal with the absolute integrity part. In verse 3, he says, He will delight in the fear of the Lord, and he will not judge by what he sees nor make a decision by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Also righteousness will be the belt about his loins and faithfulness the belt about his waist. This is the king. This is the king whose character is in control of the kingdom that I'm a part of. This is a reason to get up in the morning and cheer. This is a reason to praise God. You pick up the newspaper, it makes you want to cry. Just me? No. 24-7, all the news you can handle. When this station goes to commercial, there's another one which has a story rolling right now. And so, so much of it is, is just unimaginably depressing. And if my hope were in how well we're going to do at getting all of our brains together to make this a wonderful place to be, I would be tragically despairing. Because if, 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 if the hope that I've got is based on how clever all these guys in charge of something seem to be, oh man, you have got to be kidding. 
and but with a king like this on the throne you can get excited you can get excited I've been in some places where I was really glad to be headed home you ever been somewhere where you were really glad to be headed home and even when home is still days away I can get excited about the fact that I'm pointed towards home that this is not my home that this is not where I'm going to spend the rest of my hello have you been to this place stayed there a night or two it's like praise God this is not where I'm going to stay and we can all enjoy that experience in this life where we can look around and say you know what this isn't the way I'd have made it but this isn't where I'm staying either I'm passing through and it's closer to my date with home and I will be glad to get there when I do this this is him and his his mouth in verse 4 we've got his mouth engaged it shakes the earth it slays the wicked the things coming out of his mouth the words he's speaking are hitting people hard it's not that he's saying things against people it's that the words that he's saying the truth and integrity of his words are cutting people to the quick people are reacting to this they're shaking the earth. They're cutting down the wicked. These words, this is our king. And this is the power and the integrity of what he has to say. Does that get your attention? So the spirit of wisdom, I'm back at verse 2, the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom. Our king is a wise king. He doesn't struggle with what to do. He doesn't wonder. He doesn't need somebody else to point the way for him. He doesn't need somebody else to bring in a bright idea. He doesn't call for brainstorming sessions of his chamberlains. He's got the spirit of wisdom. And he's got the spirit of understanding. And understanding is, is many different things in, in, in a very interesting way. Understanding typically is talking about the ability to kind of synthesize, to, to, under, to have not just information, but know what to do with that information. And to process it in a way where, you, you, you know, there's a difference between knowing, uh, this is where, uh, oh man, no, we're not going down that road, okay. Uh, lots of people can answer a question on the test if it looks just exactly like the questions on the homework with different numbers in the blanks. But if you rearrange the order of the sentences and ask the question a little differently, they're lost. Because they don't understand. They just got the system. I put this number in there. I put that number in there. I divide by this and multiply by that. And that's the answer. Why is that the answer? Because I put this number in there and I put that number in there. Yeah, but why did you put those numbers? Because that's the way we did it on the homework. I put this number in there and that number in there. and Yeah, well, that's nice, but do you understand what you're doing? Don't need to understand what I'm doing. I'm getting 100 here. Leave me alone. You know, Understanding is when we grasp what's going on in the process. But understanding is also a relational word. I have an understanding with you. When an understanding person is ordinarily going to be somebody who's got their connections working right. They're in right relationship and orientation to others. And the spirit of understanding isn't just a different way of saying the spirit of wisdom or the spirit of knowledge. It's talking about that he, under, he fully grasps what's actually going on and he's relationally connected through this process. And so often these three words occur together in various ways and combinations in the Old Testament, knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. And they are related to each other, but they are not the same thing in three manifestations. And they're not three degrees of the same thing. They are three different qualities that need to be brought to bear on our situations. We need knowledge, we need wisdom, we need understanding. That was another amen moment. He's also the spirit of counsel. 
the spirit of counsel will rest upon our king. Is that exciting to you? He has the, the ability to deliver wise counsel, to be a, 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 a repository, if you will, of the counsel that we require, and strength. The spirit of the living God is where strength comes from. Strength is not discovered at the gym or in a glass. Strength is discovered at the, the throne of God. It's the spirit of the living God that brings strength to us. Oh, don't get so sober on me. But you know, folks look for strength in the strangest places. And when all else fails, we just aim for strength in numbers. If I can get enough people around me who will just agree with me, maybe I'll be strong enough to do this thing. Strength comes from the Spirit of God. The Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And that, that last one, the fear of the Lord, the reverence, the awe of God, it's describing, this passage is describing a situation where the awe of God is on Jesus. You know, I, I read through the Gospels and I see him interacting with people and nobody punches him. Nobody grabs him. And you say, well, but other people have this experience. You stir up crowds the way he stirred up crowds, people get grabbed. People get punched. Paul got left for dead, stoned and left for dead. When they went to do that to Jesus, he turned and walked through them. There's something about him that was different. And I'm my, my assumption is that this spirit of the fear of the Lord is part of what that was. That there was, it was just, you may not really love God and fear God, but you're going to have a difficult time acting like it with Him right there. There's just something about Him that made it difficult to just go ahead and do what you wanted to do. And there were plenty of folks who just wanted to pop Him one, but they didn't. And plenty of folks who would have been happy to push Him over a cliff, but they didn't. Are you home? There's something about that. I don't know what to make of all that. But now, if you'll come with me, I want to stop at Colossians chapter 1. You got a few more minutes here? That's good. I'll probably use them all. In Colossians chapter 1, <laughs> we have an unshakable kingdom, a kingdom which will remain when everything which can be shaken has been shaken. Amen? The characteristics of that kingdom emanate from the character of the king. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 says, for he rescued us. The, the he is the father that we're reading about in verse 12. He rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins God rescued us from the domain of darkness now the margin in this Bible says the word more literally is authority which it is But it describes authority or domain in the sense of a, a, an unpleasant top-down king's relationship. So we're, we're a, a, an accurate translation could also be the tyranny of darkness. We're talking about a kingdom where the king is not somebody you're glad to have as your king. We're talking about a kingdom where it is an unpleasant thing to serve this king and where you hope to slide through your life unnoticed by this king, because attention from this king is not a good thing. The tyranny of darkness. Does anybody besides me remember the tyranny of darkness? I had like three hands. Uh, the tyranny of darkness. I remember it vividly. Not going back. You guys get together and vote and decide to go live in Egypt if you want to. I'm not going back. I remember all too well what it was like to have Pharaoh for a king. I'm not going back. 
My worst days on my way to the promised land have been better than my good days in Egypt. And I'm not going back. He's rescued us from the domain of darkness and translated us to the kingdom, that region, that dominion where the, the king's character makes all the difference. He's transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Or, as the margin in this Bible says again, uh, literally the son of his love. The love of God, God's own love, the love which God is, is the character of the king and therefore the character of the kingdom that he's called me to. Is that good news to you? Is that exciting to you? The son of his love. He's not just saying the son that he's crazy fond of. He's talking about the son of his love, where his love is manifest in Jesus Christ, where he comes as a flesh and blood representative of the love of God to show us the heart of the Father for us. God so loved the world that he gave, and here he is. This kingdom, where this son is the king, and marks all of the characteristics of the kingdom from himself. That's the one we've been brought into. Is that good news for you? He's transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Now, excuse me, the, uh, the redemption there is talking about the buying out process, the buying off the market to be held off the market, being purchased and taken away from. That's good news, right? The forgiveness of sins is not the word we, we oftentimes uh, think we're going to encounter with forgiveness, or it's not the only word we encounter with forgiveness, but it's a word which means its best English rendering is pardon, but it describes a letting go as if never known. So what he's saying to us in essence is, that this kingdom where his son, the son of his love, the son who carries his love and shows his love, is the king, is a kingdom where we have the buying out of the market so that we're not for sale anymore, and the pardon for sins which says he doesn't even want to talk about it anymore. As far as he's concerned, your sin is as if he never knew about it a forgiveness, a pardon so complete and so thorough that from his perspective he has let go of the consequences as if he had never known the act. Could that get exciting? I could get excited about that. Now let's go back to Hebrews chapter 12 and finish. Is God good? So all that said about the kingdom, what is it going to do to us? Well, verse 28 tells us very specifically what it should do to us. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. That's the last part of Robert Ross's statement on the kingdom when he said membership in this kingdom through faith in Christ ought to result in glad service and reverent worship on the part of all. Nobody ought to have to encourage us in this. We shouldn't need to be reminded. Receive this unshakable kingdom with its unshakable king. Since there's so much to be grateful for about this kingdom, we should be prepared to show gratitude And to serve in such a way that, that, that let, let's put it this way. Here, let's back up. An acceptable service. Acceptable there means well-pleasing. The service we're talking about is not the, the, when we think of minister and the words that we typically associate with that, this isn't on that, it is not in the family of diakonos. This is a, a, a different word which describes a hired laborer. Now get this, this picture. In a world where not everybody's hiring themselves for labor, 
we live in a time where the vast majority of people you're going to know have a job and they're in the, in the habit of hiring themselves for pay. But in the simpler parts of the world even today, the great majority of people don't work for anybody else, don't get a paycheck, don't know much about what money is. They don't have much use for it. They produce the goods they need and they trade goods for other goods. Are you home? In a world like that, in a world like the first century was, where the vast majority of people are not in someone else's hire, the person who hired himself out was saying, in essence, I'm prepared to take the labor that I would normally use to serve me and my household and use it to serve you and your ambition instead. If you will, in return for that, give me some money. You trade me some money, and instead of working on my farm and my family and my food and my house, I'm going to work on something for you. Are you getting the picture? A hired laborer's labor. And he's talking about giving that labor to God, where instead of building my stuff, I want to go to work building his stuff. Where instead of building up my house, I'm interested in building his house. And what I'm willing to give the effort, the labor, the skills that I would have applied to myself and to mine, to him. So that he can use it. And I'm doing this in a way that it's being described here by the Spirit as well-pleasing that I'm offering my hired services well-pleasingly to him. This is what I want to do because of the kingdom that I've been brought into. Is that a good picture? Three of you thought it was a good picture. The rest of you are not so sure. All righty. Well, then, let, let's press beyond that with reverence and awe. And obviously the two words are very closely related in the sense that you could switch awe and reverence almost as the translations here. But the, the first word describes, uh, it's actually in its ordinary usage, it means modesty or bashfulness. It's talking about somebody who, who looks down because they don't feel like they can look right at you. It's the kind of reaction, you know, if, if the President of the United States walked in here right now, I might find myself looking at the carpet. Uh, it's just, you're all looking at me very peculiarly right now. I mean, you'd like to think you'd go, hey, it's good to see you, but it probably it'd be more like, oh, my word, it's the president. I know you, I've seen you on TV. You know, I, I just don't, somehow or another, I don't really picture myself throwing my arms around him. It's just, it, it seems like it would be the wrong idea somehow. And so we're talking about that sort of modesty or bashfulness which, which kind of says, oh shucks, I don't know what to do. Except when we, when we put it in comparison to God instead of just ordinary modesty or bashfulness, and the word is used to describe ordinary modesty or bashfulness, it, it's used in other places in the scripture to, des to describe the proper, proper behavior of people towards other people in certain settings. But it... it when it's used in relationship to God, we're talking about awe, where my modesty is inspired by His awesomeness. It's like, this is, this is God we're talking about. That'll kind of take some of the starch out of you. It's God. Oh. You, might, you might find yourself just a little subdued by that realization. And then... The, the second word is a very interesting word. It's got the, the uh, prefix for well on the front of it, and it's, in a literal sense, it means taking well or a well taking, which seems like a really, you know, like, well, that's not helping us at all, except that it therefore comes to mean caution. See, I, I might just stride out, or I might well take my steps make sure that I know what I'm doing be cautious not 
afraid cautious, but attentively cautious, paying close attention to what I'm doing. And then when we, when we see it in relationship to God again, it's describing a reverence. It's describing a, a, a willingness to... So we're talking about being awed by God in a way that makes me feel small and reverent towards God in a way which makes me want to be cautious and sensible about what I'm doing. And he's saying, listen, this is what this is supposed to do for you. The kingdom that you've been called into is supposed to get your attention in such a way that you want to offer your service to God in a way which is well-pleasing while holding a modest view of yourself in awe of Him and revering Him so much that you don't want to misstep, that you don't want to mess up, that you don't want to be casual or sloppy or foolish in any way, but that you're highly attentive to what you're doing and focused on it. That's a picture of what people who get this look like. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Is that an amen moment? Let's stand up together, if you will. In just a moment, we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper together and celebrate this king and his kingdom. As we come to do that, I want to take a moment first and confess my faith in Jesus Christ. In, he, in Romans chapter 10, it says at verse 9, that if, thou sh if, if you should confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. I want to take just a moment, and I'm going to do that. If you'd like to join me, you're welcome to. Perhaps somewhere in this process you found yourself pricked in your heart, just kind of sensing that something needed to break, something needed to change. And you find yourself wondering, I don't know how to do that. I don't know what to do. This would be the answer right here. Confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that the Father has raised him from the dead. Receive the salvation of God. Let's take just a moment and pray. Dear God, I thank you in the name of Jesus for hearing my cry today. I do believe in my heart that you've raised Jesus from the dead. And I declare with my very own mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord. Thank you, Father, for this new life and this new citizenship in this great kingdom with this amazing king in Jesus mighty name amen